And now, it's time for that great new game show. It's the PowerShell Podcast. It's all about PowerShell and the PowerShell community. Something new, something revolutionary. And now, here's your hosts, Jordan Hammond and Andrew Plaw. Hey everybody, welcome back to the PowerShell Podcast. I'm host Jordan Hammond with local legend, global legend, Andrew Plaw. And today we're joined by a special guest, Matthias Jessen. And you go by IAS Reset Me on... IAS Reset Me would be my preferred online handle, yes. Okay. All right. I want to get started out, like I know the story, but what's the story behind your handle? Because it's kind of an interesting uh, little backstory. Right. I think um, around the same time I picked up PowerShell, which is more than a decade ago, um, I was working sort of my first full-time IT job at a managed hosting provider, right? A managed service provider. And um, I was in a group, I was sort of in an operational team with 20 to 25 other Windows sysadmins. And our responsibility was to follow up on operational issues throughout our customer base, right? And so many of the customers we had were enterprise customers and they would run uh, you know, their line of business applications on .NET on IIS. So IIS was by far the biggest sort of Windows component, the biggest Windows platform component I sort of, I was working with every day, right? And prior to me joining the, uh, the ops team, uh, I had been working in, in the same company in their NOC, their network operation center. And so my job uh, prior to sort of becoming a full-time sysadmin, had been looking at uh, monitoring stacks, right? So I would I'd be looking at four screens. Uh, one of the, one of them had you know like SCCM running. One had Nagios running. One had some, some some other monitoring tool running. And then whenever an alert came up, it was our task to basically log a ticket, escalate if appropriate, or fix it if we could uh, fix it on this on the spot. And among this group of uh, among this group of NOG operators, it was sort of a joke that uh, IAS problems were the easiest to solve because you just restart the web server and then you leave it alone, right? Uh, it's basically like the web server equivalent of have you tried turning it off and on again? And so it sort of became a running joke that any problem involving a Windows server running running any sort of web application, just IIS reset, right? IIS reset, restart, um, run that, and then like forget about it. Maybe see if if the monitoring will, will turn green again, just based on that. And we sort of got into it. Me and another guy got sort of into a turf war about uh, who, who could like plaster our internal documentation systems with an, with as many jokes as possible about IAS reset solving any problem. And he ended up buying the domain IAS reset, but DK, DK for Denmark, where, where we were working at the time. And uh, I sort of had to one up him. So I ended up buying the domain IAS reset.me. And then we started linking a bunch of internal documentation to sort of each our copy of the IAS reset documentation. Uh, and said, and then I was like, okay, I got this domain, IIS reset, but me. So when I started uh, signing up for socials, I just sort of reused that handle because nobody else, you know, had picked that for a good reason. And it sort of just stuck. Um, and I didn't think too much about it until I sort of started engaging with the wider PowerShell community and people started coming up to me, uh, sort of saying, you're giving me PTSD, right? I used to be a Windows sysadmin. I never want to touch IIS again. And every time you pop up online, I see IIS reset me in the, in the middle of everything. And so, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know if it's like, a um, it, it, it's turned into a bit of a curse, but uh, I still like it. IIS reset me. It's sort of unique, uh, and tells a little bit about sort of where I'm coming from. So a decade ago, you were using some PowerShell, got your name, um, working for an MSP with some clients. Um, how, where did you go with PowerShell and, and with your career after that, after working at the MSP? So I think sort of my early career in, in PowerShell were, um, it was intertwined, right? Because <clears throat> me starting to work with, uh, with Windows Server as sort of the thing I, I thought and dreamed about every day and night and sort of work with every day. Um, and at scale, right? We had customers who had maybe uh, five Windows servers to run a couple of applications and, and and exchange organizations, but we also had customers who had a thousand servers or five thousand servers, right? And so, when you're dealing with small and medium um, sort of business setups uh, with maybe a handful of servers, 
clicking around the GUI, doing everything by like RDPing into job post and then clicking around the, the graphical user interface of the management applications. That sort of makes sense if you have, again, like maybe between one and 10 servers, right? But if you have a thousand web servers and you need to whether deploy updates, deploy new applications, uh, you know, uh, roll around SSL certificates, that sort of thing. If you have a thousand servers, then it becomes untenable, unfeasible, right? To to manually RDP into them, it's going to take you a day every time you need like the simplest uh, the simplest change uh, to your infrastructure, right? And so, it became obvious to me pretty pretty quickly that PowerShell was going to sort of enable some of this management at scale stuff. And then you also couldn't get around the fact, uh, remember this was around, the, so we're talking about like 2010 here, 2011 maybe. And so at the time, Exchange Server 2010 was sort of ubiquitous for Windows sysadmins, right? Like if, if, if you were running a big company and you're sort of relying on Microsoft stack, of course, you're going to invest in, in Ex Exchange Server 2010. And we had a lot of customers who relied on Exchange uh, 2010 as their primary uh, messaging and, and collaboration platform, right? And so it also became more and more apparent that more and more Microsoft products, Exchange in, in particular, required the use of Windows PowerShell 2.0, right? There, there are some things in, in Exchange 2010 and actually as early as 2007 that you can only do by interfacing with the PowerShell module that ships with that particular version of Exchange, right? So as an Exchange admin, which I sort of, uh, uh, I thought I had to moonlight as uh, uh, a couple of times because again, we were maybe 25 people looking after 700 customers. So we would sort of spread our workload. So you sort of had to be a generalist, right? You had to know a little bit of everything. And so in order to be able to participate in sort of operational issues around exchange, you had to learn PowerShell and then sort of further on enabling sort of scalability at scale, PowerShell sort of was the obvious choice um, because it sort of interfaced with all the management components on Windows already, right? So you want to uh, you want to interact with uh, WMI. Okay, PowerShell already has native support for, for wrapping WMI instances, right? Uh, it has extensive support for querying the WMI repository on your machine. Um, it has support for things like XML, which again is ubiquitous in sort of Windows environment uh, configuration uh, files, right? Uh, it interfaces really well, well with .NET being built on top of .NET, so that also meant that code that I had previously written in C Sharp, which was sort of the only programming language I was really comfortable with at the time, could also be translated into this new scripting language, right? If I'd written uh, 100 lines of C Sharp, I could probably take sort of like the types or the APIs that I was using with, and I could reuse those in my, in my PowerShell scripts, and it sort of just worked, right? So I could take a bunch of stuff I already knew, and I could take a stuff, uh, a bunch of stuff on Windows that I needed to interact with anyways, preferably in some unattended way, right, where I wasn't required to sit at the machine and click around the GUI. And PowerShell was just, it was just an obvious choice for for sort of solving all of those problems at, at once. Um, so that's that's sort of how I really got sort of got my feet wet at first, right. Manage a thousand Windows servers. I'm not going to do this by hand. Let's let's break out something else that that we can automate with. Kind of last thing about PowerShell. I'm not gonna. I, I heard this somewhere. I know I'm not. I'm not thinking. Of it, but it's kind of like a glue for IT. Just no matter what aspect you work in, if if you work with computers, PowerShell is going to have value at some point. It it is. It it very much is. Right. It is a glue language. Uh, it was it was designed as such. Right. Like. It, in the meantime, a lot of people have found many other use cases for PowerShell, and it's sort of also become like a very powerful general purpose scripting language that people are using for all sorts of other things. But initially, that was what it was, right? It was meant as a glue language. You have a bunch of sysadmins who are not necessarily well versed in um, yeah, C Sharp, C++, whatever it is, and you don't necessarily want to educate them to be software developers or system engineers, right? You want to leverage the experience they already have with the, to with the management tooling they have, and then sort of enable them to sort of sort of power up and sort of glue these things together, I should say. And I'd already seen that in sort of the other side of the company I was working with. We also had non-Microsoft environments, right? So we also have had a large group of, of sysadmins of operational technicians who were looking after uh, Unix type systems, right? Uh, you know, Linux distributions, BSD, AIX, that sort of thing. And, uh, and they were largely using Perl Right, Perl was sort of the the glue language of choice, as it were. Uh, at the time, we were also seeing a little more sort of Pythony stuff, or like management tools written in Python, both for Windows and Unix, by the way. 
uh, but Perl was sort of the, that was the ubiquitous glue language in sort of the Unix world. And there wasn't really anything like that in PowerShell, right? We had, we had VB script, Visual Basic script, uh, which is uh, great for a subset of the interactions that PowerShell is really good at, right? Namely, uh, COM, COM plus, right? So uh, uh, component services on Windows, VB script is excellent at interfacing with that. And it has a lot of bindings for interacting with the shell, right? So the UI that you use when, when you use Windows, right? Uh, but like the .NET, uh, it, it really, it, it wasn't integrated with .NET the way, um, the way PowerShell was. Uh, and it was sort of limited how many how many management APIs you could sort of interact with without um, writing a lot of not very readable code. Um, so PowerShell sort of filled that gap, right? It sort of filled the gap that Perl was filling on a lot of Linux and, and, and BSD distributions. Um, again, sort of allowing you to glue many com many network components together, right? A word that comes to mind when you describe kind of where PowerShell was and, and the tools that it gave you, it, it kind of sound, sounds to me like empowerment, like it empowered you. It, you were able to use C-sharp, you could use XML, you could interface uh, with these things. Absolutely, right. And and I love the vendor documentation I had was, um, uh, we had a lot of vendor documentation for WMI, right? Because that used to be sort of the management and instrumentation platform prior to, to PowerShell as a, as a tool coming along. Uh, and and I could reuse that, right? I could reuse all the knowledge and all the documentation we had in this new newly changing programming language. So again, so it, it became easy to adopt because it was already interfacing with all the things I needed in the environment, right? Dude, Jordan, I don't know about you, but as I'm hearing this, I'm going back and like we've heard so many people's experiences with PowerShell and this kind of Exchange 2010 kind of timeline and what right. it was like for everyone during that time and how it's a little bit different. We've heard from what it's like with people inside Microsoft. It's just such kind of a, an interesting thing and a fun time. Yeah, I, th I think if you if you want to get sort of like, if you want to step a few more steps sort of further back and look at it from a bigger perspective, uh, the person you need to talk to is Jeffrey Snover, and you probably know that already, right? But he's he's also told this story about how how he tried to sort of radically radically change the, uh, the the management tooling experience in Windows prior to PowerShell coming out, right? Like PowerShell was not his first project at Microsoft. He had already been involved in shipping the, uh, uh, what is it called? The services for Unix, uh, SFU, which I think is a really fun abbreviation that they shipped in Windows Server 2003. So this was the thing where like you could check a box in add or remove programs and then all of a sudden you have grep at the command line and you have awk and you have set. But as Jeffrey later <laughs> remarked, it turns out that when you take a bunch of, um, when you take these, these management tools from Unix-like operating systems and all the management interfaces are text files, then obviously all the management tools are also text modification tools, right? They're, that's all they do. And it turns out that that doesn't work in Windows because the configuration subsystems in Windows are usually not text file based, right? They're stored in registries or they're stored in cap files or they're stored um, uh, elsewhere in data formats that are not just straight ASCII text that you can sort of pipe back and forth. So that was an attempt to sort of upgrade the management experience on Windows and it failed completely because Windows was not the right target for grab, set, awk, and so on, right? There are good management tools and platforms where modifying text makes you a manager of the system. But if that if that's not the case, then it's not going to work in that environment. And so that's sort of where, where PowerShell came in into it, right? He, he first tried to introduce a bunch of Unix tools because that's what the users said they wanted and then the users figured out that that was not, not actually what they wanted because they couldn't use them for what they were trying to use them for. His next attempt was then trying to say, okay, let's qualify the tooling for WMI, which is the actual management interface on Windows. And so that's how WMIC came about. And so WMIC came out and Jeffrey had this idea that uh, all the vendors are going to see that there's now better client tooling. They're going to write better documentation or, and better WMI modules and, and WMI manifests. And then everyone can sort of just partake in in, um, in the proliferation of management tooling that, that's going to grow out of that. Uh, but once again, that, that experiment also slightly failed because it turns out nobody wants to write a bunch of WMI manifests and a bunch of WMI modules. That's also like a complicated subsystem. So it was really hard to get people to participate in like the, the content creation around uh, WMI and WMIC. And then finally he sort of realizes that, oh wait, 
maybe we need to rethink this whole thing. And that's sort of where PowerShell, how PowerShell came, uh, came to be, right? There's a bunch of different intersection, intersecting problems, again, anchored in the, the tooling experience for people managing Windows that he sort of failed to, to solve in a number of ways. And then finally, PowerShell sort of became the solution to all of these problems. Um, fascinating story, obviously, uh, but it's extra fascinating when you've been a part of it, right? Okay. I, I, experienced, I experienced the things that he was trying to address by, by designing something like PowerShell, right? And I was also able to see my own career and my own, uh, my own abilities grow by then adopting that tool and sort of use, use that to empower myself, as you say. Uh, so, so yeah, I, I would say massively, massively empowered, empowering. I, I think the other part of that is to get adoption is building a welcoming community. For which sure. Him, him and Don Jones, and I, I know I'm, I'm missing some of the key people in that one, but the community they built up around it once it first started off, I think played a huge part in the adoption because it doesn't matter how good something is, you got to get people to adopt it. Absolutely right. And I was actually a little shocked, right? So like I was again, I've been using PowerShell for over a decade, but I was actually sort of late to the party, right? It was there was a bunch of people who were already there when when I showed up, um, and so I was kind of shocked to find out that as early as two thousand six, uh, they were doing like uh, probably something like the Monad Shell Summit, right? Prior to the release of before PowerShell was called PowerShell, basically. And so I was I was sort of shocked to find out that exactly as you say. Uh, Jeffrey and some of the people around him at, at Microsoft had sort of actively been trying to foment this community, like almost before they had a product, right? Almost before they had anything, anything to ship. Um, and that also enabled my own journey with PowerShell, right? Like by the time I sort of start digging deep and, and trying to see like, okay, what, how, how much of an expert can I become in this thing? There was already blog posts out there, uh, by people like, um, uh, Rambling Cookie Monster, right? Or um, uh, Tome, uh, who else comes to mind? Uh, Lacey Wynn Admin, right? Um, uh, like there was a bunch of people out there who had already sort of been on this journey, you know, five, 10 years prior to me, and they were all sharing, right? There was already a healthy community of sort of uh, sharing, showing what you've got, uh, leveling each other up. Uh, yeah, that was very, very encouraging early on, I remember. You also mentioned we need to get Jeffrey Snover on, which I would I would love to hear his perspective through this whole thing. So. Yeah, I mean, again, I, I I'm not Jeffrey, and I, I I can't speak for him, but he's he's told many uh, many an interesting story about you know the whole experience of, of developing and and maintaining PowerShell, and yeah, you should definitely get him on. At last year's summit, he was one of three people that I struggled to approach. I never I never got to. To, to to Jeff Snover, uh, but it was him, Jason Helmick, and Justin Grody. I was all I was terrified to meet those three, even though they're. I, I did eventually say hi to Jason and Justin, and they are the nicest people ever. Like it's exactly how you expect the community to be. They are, they are, and I would all the same goes for Jeffrey, right? Like I completely understand what you're saying, but the the three people you just mentioned are three of the nicest yeah. and most generous people I've had in this community. So yeah, I think I would have got there. If he had stayed, but that one he had to leave after the first day. He, he did his uh, opening speech where he talked about it's okay to make a mistake, which is right, right. And I enjoyed that a lot. But then he he was, I think he had to he had places to be after that one. So I I never got to build up the confidence. But uh, if he shows up this year, well, I'm going to say he's trying to have a conversation with <laughs> Jovial is very generous. Yeah, uh, he also swears more off stage than on stage. I find that hilarious. Uh, <laughs> like I, I, I can't like keep like split personality. I swear as much on stage, almost as much on stage as I do in real life. But uh, Jeffrey has like a fantastic way of compartmentalizing the two, uh, which is uh, really entertaining when you're spending time with him off stage. I should say. <laughs> now, I have a question. So you mentioned you're working at this MSP. You're doing like a bunch of Windows stuff. Yeah. Why do you know C sharp? Where did that get introduced into your little world? So uh, knowing C Sharp was sort of incidental or accidental, actually. Uh, I've had a fascination with computers and how they work, you know, how to program them and programming languages by extension since I was a kid, basically. Um, I grew up in, in Northern Europe in the 90s, right? And in the 90s, there was sort of the, the window where computers went from being sort of exotic business machines to ubiquitous, right? Like they were everywhere. 
Uh, when I enrolled in school, we didn't have, you know, like in public school in, in the mid 90s, um, there weren't a lot of computers around, but they were already in the offices and there were a computer lab, right? So in 1996, 1997, we already had like a computer lab at the public school, right? And over the next four or five years, so um, sort of me from childhood in, into, into being a teenager, basically, I sort of observed how these computers became more and more, right? They were all over the place. And so by the time, by the time I reached, you know, fifth, sixth grade, um, I had my own, you know, like domain username to the school network of computers. And I was really fascinated about this, right? I was fascinated about this concept of being able to like log into one machine, save a document, and then like you could, you could access the same things on another computer elsewhere. That was sort of fascinating, right? And I kept, I kept being fascinated by these machines and how you could programming, program them and what you could do with them. But I also remember there not really being any, anyone around in my life who could show me, right? Like I didn't have, uh, I'm the oldest of three siblings. I didn't have any older, uh, older siblings to teach me, right? Uh, I didn't have a cousin around. Um, uh, the only sort of kids in the neighborhood who I knew were into computers were a little bit older and probably didn't want to hang out with me anyways, right? So I, was sort of, I felt sort of a, a bit isolated and a bit like I sort of want to explore this grown up thing over here that I'm really fascinated by, but I don't like there's no one here to take me by the hand and show me. Right. Um, and so and so by the time I sort of reached high school, I sort of forced myself through learning like at least one programming language. And the reason I the reason I picked up uh, C sharp was um, I knew about the net from having just been a regular Windows user. Right. So in the early days of .NET, people would ship buggy applications. And so like the one of the first times I sort of remember being aware that .NET and the .NET framework was the thing was because I crashed something on like my grandmother's computer, right? And then like a Visual Studio debugger pops up because the manifest that shipped with the application was in, it was incorrectly configured. So it's like, what is this .NET thing, right? Like what with all these stack traces and things. So I started looking at these things, things up on the internet. And I basically found that C sharp was a language for which it was the easiest to set up the tool chain. That was it, right? That was the number one reason for picking C sharp was that I could install the net on my machine. I could install Visual Studio. It wasn't called, called Community Edition. It was called something else, but they had a free tier version of Visual Studio. You installed it. It came with the compiler. Everything was configured. And as soon as you started a project, you get like this template, right? Like you start like a console application project in Visual Studio. You get like a ready-baked template of an application that you can actually build and run right away, right? Just like click the button and then oh, you're actually running an application already. And so that not having to jump through a bunch of hoops, not having to, you know, read a hundred pages of documentation to find out how to, uh, you know, point to the right linking libraries for importing whatever and, and whatever. I used to always have these problems whenever I tried to pick up a programming language that like, oh, the language itself seems fine, but like the, the whole tool chain around it was just a nightmare. And so I never really got into the practice of coding. But C Sharp, yeah, Microsoft Visual Studio it sort of solved that problem, right? It's just one click install and you're ready to go. And so that's what I did. I, I bought a couple of books uh, around C Sharp. I think I ended up only using one of them um, and I wrote a couple of applications and then didn't do much uh, of it until um, until I got this full time job, right? So, so that in parallel with with all the the partial stuff, uh, once in a while, you know, a manager would come down and say like, "Oh, we have this reporting application, right? Like we have a an application that you know spits me out a report of how many of you took overtime last week, basically, right?" And it was written by some other guy who also knew a little bit of C sharp, and then he left the company, and now nobody knows how to maintain it because we're just a bunch of sysadmins. We don't know code how. So <clears throat> he would ask me, and so these were sort of, this was sort of my hands-on software development experience, right? Like someone would come to me and say like, oh, I have this sort of small shitty application. It's kind of buggy, can you fix it? Yeah, sure, I'll take a look at it, I'll refactor it, I'll, uh, um, I'll redeploy it. That taught me a lot. Um, and so again, some of these experiences, I was able to sort of like just translate straight into, into PowerShell, which is great, right? Um, you get a lot for free that way, by by picking up a new a new language and then you can sort of reuse what you already have. Very cool. You've been uh you have it would seem a deep capacity for understanding the language if you've kind of been using things for so long playing around with languages kind of really figuring it out um I guess the old fashioned way. 
Because now it seems like there's a lot more easy ways to get started with. Uh, maybe. Uh, I, 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 again, I've always found that like a lot of programming languages the, and sort of the environment and the tool chains around them are geared towards a more academic crowd. And by that, I don't mean that you necessarily need to like have a PhD to pick up a programming language, right? But people who have been educated, right? Um, and who have been e educated, not just in sort of like the basic concepts of how a computer or, or how an application runtime works, uh, but they've also been introduced to the tooling in sort of a safe environment, right? Like you go to your first compiler course at university or you go uh, do a professional bachelor's degree somewhere like there's going to be a teacher there helping you to you know set up uh, set up the, the the development environment and so on and so on and i i think i mentioned before i have like 10 thumbs like you, you should never hire me to, to like build anything in your house uh, i come out of like a family of craftsmen and like i i would i would uh, i would do their their legacy a disservice if i ever built anything uh, i'm i'm really clumsy and I'm also really impatient, right? Like I don't want to have to 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 read through a hundred uh, pages of documentation just to like compile a hello world application, right? Um, yeah, I, I love the the not handy thing. I uh, <laughs> I went to do Habitat for Humanity, which is just uh, helping to build houses, and right. the foreman there watched me for like thirty seconds. He's like, "Yeah, you can list some stuff," but I was I was not allowed to do any, yeah. any skilled work. <laughs> yeah. I think I, I used to I used to go working with my my grandfather um, sort of the last years before he retired. He was working as a traveling um, uh, like carpentry installer, basically, right? So he would you know he would he would he would go out to people's houses and put up like a new fence in their garden or their uh, or their outhouse, or whatever it was. And so I would sometimes go around with him in the summer, right? Like my mom would be working, I I'd be traveling around with him working. And he, whenever we had to like install anything where it's like everything is sort of pre-cut, you just lay it down and, you know, like put, put a screw in it, then he would allow me to do it. But whenever we had to like actually build something, right? Like you had to saw off a piece of wood or like measure something out. He was like, no, 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 let me take over, right? And pro probably for the better. So I want to pick your brain a little bit. Um, is it fair to say that you know a thing or two about the PowerShell language or the engine, I should say? I I mean, I am continuously surprised by the things that don't know, right? Like, like not just on a weekly, like on a daily basis. Uh, but uh, I think it is fair to say that I probably know more about the PowerShell language engine than most. Um, sort of for a broad definition of most, there are definitely more people in the world who know less than me than, uh, than there are the opposite, right? Um, so yeah, feel free to try me. So that's, that's a great sign of how much you know when their first thing is a, a, a core grasp of what they don't know and they open with that instead of what they do. That's a great sign that someone knows a lot about it. <laughs> um, my first question is, so I mentioned the PowerShell language engine or the PowerShell engine. What does that really refer to when we say that? I mean, you're going to have to ask whoever says it, right? Because people mean different things, even though they use the same words sometimes, right? Uh, when, when in conversation we're talking about the PowerShell language engine, then I'm talking about, um, I'm talking about a couple of different things, but we can probably narrow it down to say we're talking about components that live in system .management automation, right? So this namespace that sort of cons uh, consists of uh, the parser. Um, all the runtime components, so like run spaces, execution context, all of these things, right? So all the things that are core to making your PowerShell scripts run, basically. And so when we talk about the language engine, we're talking basically about the core components that are responsible for taking your script, which is some text on disk or that you paste into the, uh, into the terminal, uh, taking that turning it into executable code and then executing it, right? That's what we're talking about. The components that are involved in from the second PowerShell so accepts these, the, this, this string of source code that you've given it and on, until it sort of gives you an answer and says like, oh, by the way, I was able to execute this and this is the result, by the way. Everything that happens in between there is the work of what we broadly in an umbrella term might call the PowerShell language engine, right? Uh, it might be a little too narrow to sort of scope it down to just what happens in the lifetime of read, uh, read pass, execute a script, right? Uh, but that's sort of that's the first place where my mind goes when someone says the partial language engine. That makes sense. And, and you would like to, uh, you would like me to talk about some of the components involved in that? I can imagine. Um, 
Yeah, just so, the basic example real quick, if we could, because you mentioned that it's what happens when you take uh, whatever kind of code, run it, and then get the result on the other end. Right. Can you maybe step through a little bit of that? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, imagine uh, imagine that you open, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to use Windows PowerShell as an example here, but like it, this also applies to PowerShell and PowerShell on other platforms, by the way. But let's say you, you're at your Windows machine, you open the run prompt and you launch PowerShell.exe dash no profile. Uh, that means you don't load any profile scripts, right? You just load the default applications with its, its default uh, modules loaded. Then you remove uh, PS readline because PS readline is also going to do a bunch of stuff to invoke the language engine in the background. That's how you get all the nice syntax highlighting. But let's say you open PowerShell.exe and you unload a PS readline. So the next thing you do is you, let's say you type the path to a script on disk. Uh, so path to script.ps1, right? So the second you hit enter in your prompt and are expecting this script to maybe execute, right? What happens then? So what happens is the PowerShell.exe takes this input that you've provided and it's going to uh, send it through a path resolution mechanism, right? PowerShell has these, uh, this concept of uh, provider abstractions, uh, the most prominent example being the file system. Uh, the reason that there's this abstraction that you don't find in, in something like Bash or CMD maybe is that PowerShell also wants to avail other types of storage as if it was a file system, right? So this is how you can CD the, into the cert drive on Windows, for example, these sorts of things. You can navigate the registry, right? Uh, but basically what happens is that the path is passed off to the file system provider that hosts the share in which this path resolves to. Uh, it reads the file into memory, um, and then it invokes a component called the parser. So the input to the parser is source code, right? Either in the form of a path to a script or a, a string containing the raw source code. That would be the input for the parser. The parser then further invokes another component called the tokenizer. And the tokenizer, as the name implies, tokenizes the input. What does that mean? Well, it means that it looks at all the squiggly characters in your script and then it sort of like cuts it into meaningful chunks. So if you have a, uh, if you have a statement like, uh, dollar sign and then some variable name and then the equal sign and then some uh, expression could be a statement, could be a command, could be a pipeline, whatever. That's an as assignment statement, right? But the source code itself consists of, shall we say, three parts, right? It consists of the variable expression that would be one token. So the dollar sign and the name of the variable or the path to the variable expression. Then the equal signs would be a separate token, right? It signifies some, some operation. And then whatever value might be another uh, variable, for example, on the right-hand side would then be a third token. So the tokenizer sort of cuts the, cuts the source code into meaningful chunks, feeds it, feeds it back, back to the parser. The parser goes through uh, what we might call sort of the rules of the language, right? The syntax rules of the language. And then it tries to make sense of whether what was input uh, complies with those requirements, right? So again, there are things you can't syntact syntactically do in PowerShell, right? It doesn't make sense to have like um, a variable and then two dots before a property name, right? That's a syntax error. Whereas a single dot is the member invocation operator, but two dots, that's just nonsense, right? Because there's no range operator for two variables. So the parser will go through all of these, these rules according to the input it's seeing. And at some point it'll say, okay, this looks good. There are no syntax errors. I can make sense of this. And the parser is then going to build what's known as an abstract syntax tree or a syntax tree. Now, a syntax tree is a little bit different from source code in that Usually we don't have a texture representation for it, right? You can't really save an AST to disk. We don't have a, sort of a, a well-defined encoding format for it. It's a description of some, some hierarchy of objects that exist in memory uh, after the parser is done uh, passing the script. And the major difference between ASTs and your input source code is that we don't care about trivia. And what do I mean by trivia? Well, I mean things like white space, right? If if you write a, again, if you write like a variable assignment statement in PowerShell, so you have the variable expression, then you have an assignment operator, and then you have some value that you want to assign. Um, there are a number of different ways I could write that, right? If I open my editor right now, I could have two spaces before the equal sign and only one after. I could have three, three spaces on each side of the equal line. I could put the value expression down on the next line. But when we translate, 
these different variations into a syntax tree, the syntax tree remains the same. Because from sort of from the language's perspective, it's doing the same thing. It's still just a variable, an assignment operator, and some value expression, right? So by sort of turning it into this inter intermediary representation that we can hold in memory and that we can sort of inspect, we can sort of reach a disagreement about the behavior that should that should arise from different kinds of code that's actually the same, right? And so the abstract syntax tree is interesting for a number of reasons. First of all, it's the primary interface by which your editor, your favorite code editors, um, syntax highlighters, that sort of thing, all of these language tooling things that you use implicitly all the time, they are driven by the AST basically. So what happens is every time you uh, punch a, a key on your keyboard in VS Code or in PowerShell IC or any other editor you're using, uh, at least with integrated PowerShell language support, as soon as you, as soon as there's like a key up event, um, the editor is going to feed your entire script back to PowerShell's parser. It's going to have the parser give back this AST, this abstract uh, syntax uh, uh, tree rep representation. And then it's going to use that alongside with any passing errors that the parser might have thrown out to tell you things like, oh, you have a syntax error up here on line three, or, oh, by the way, uh, this this parenthesis up here is uh, unbalanced, right? Because we got a parser error saying that there's a there's a closing parenthesis missing somewhere. So this ability to sort of generate the intermediary representation of a piece of code and sort of being able to manipulate that without executing the code is basically what runs most of most of your language tooling, most of your editors, right? So you're all using the AST perhaps more more directly uh, than you think every day, right? The next step in this whole language en engine processing uh, step is to take the AST and then compile it. And so uh, compilation basically entails taking the syntax tree. So now we're now we're in agreement about what the user asked the programming language to do, right? These are the steps, these are the statements that we want to execute. And now we need to take this, uh, this intermediary representation and turn it into executable code, because again, we want to execute the script at some point. And so PowerShell leverages heavily uh, a, an API that came out with .NET uh, 3.5. Uh, everything I'm describing here, I should say, applies to PowerShell 3.0 and up. What I'm describing here does, at least from this point out, does not apply to PowerShell 2.0. But from PowerShell 3.0 and up, uh, uh, the language engine or the uh, the compiler uh, in the PowerShell language engine uh, makes use of a an API called Link Expressions. Uh, link expressions uh, came out at the same time as link language integrated queries, which is like this um, this, this query feature in C sharp. Um, and uh, basically, what we do is we we do a bunch of lowering passes, and a lowering pass in a compiler is basically taking a piece of code or a piece of of the syntax tree that looks kind of complicated and then simplifying it. That is, that there are some statements that are some uh, expressions that you can that you can take and simplify, right? This is the same thing as when you're like you're reducing fractions in school, right? Um, two over four can be reduced to one over two, basically, right? And then that's easy to calculate. And so we basically, like the, the compiler does the exact same thing. It goes through all these statements and then it says like, oh, here's a slightly complicated one or one that only makes sense in PowerShell. It doesn't make sense to the .NET runtime or to the CPU, but I know that I can rewrite this to a simpler form that I can then get the CPU, or in this case, the .NET runtime to execute. So we do a bunch of lowering passes, a bunch of other optimizations. Uh, PowerShell is also filled with like what we might call run runtime instrumentation hooks, right? So when we construct the executable code from the syntax tree, there's a bunch of hooks for uh, things like tracers, so that when you run trace command, for example, you're actually going to get live tracing output uh, from the runtime. So there's a bunch of stuff for that. There's also a bunch of binding. Uh, there's also a bunch of stuff for binding input and output. Again, PowerShell has this really cool, uh, sort of almost radical pipeline functionality where we're passing object references across the pi pipeline and then sort of resurrecting them on the other side. We can also get into that later. That's actually one of the cooler parts of PowerShell, right? But like we have this, we have this in PowerShell. Uh, that's not necessarily a native concept to a CPU or again in this in this case the .NET virtual uh, virtual runtime. And so we rewrite all, uh, the compiler rewrites all of this. 
Uh, and then it ends up uh, constructing one of these link expressions that then map to native operations in the .NET runtime. And uh, all of these, this expression tree is then attached to something we call a compile script block. Uh, this happens automatically in the background. This also happens if you write a literal script block in the terminal, right? You open PowerShell.exe, you open with the curly brackets, so you get like executable code, right? That's a script block literal. You write the script block literal. As soon as you hit enter, PowerShell will actually compile that script block, right? It'll generate the expressions that it actually needs to, uh, to execute in the background. And it'll do that even though you haven't actually executed the script block, right? So all of this, again, sort of happens implicitly and in the background. And then at some point, once we're done with this step and we're so like, okay, we have all the, the script blocks, we have all the code, it's been passed, it's been compiled. Then we execute that, we invoke that expression tree, and then we sort of just let the .NET runtime engine take care of the rest. And then uh, there's a bunch more things that I'm not going to go into because it's a long time since I've been looking at it and it's very complicated, but there's a bunch of like uh, output marshalling going on, right? Uh, so making sure that uh, various objects from various providers are being tagged with uh, extra metadata, right? So like any, any item, uh, any object that corresponds to an item in a in the file system provider, for example, will have a bunch of hidden properties attached that tells you something about which PS drive it was sourced from, for example, uh, or whether it's a file or a directory, right? Because the file system doesn't necessarily map to PowerShell's provider mod, uh, model. So all of these things that happen in the background, including a bunch of very complicated rules for when something is an error and when something isn't an error, uh, then sort of it's, it's taken care of by um, what we might call the, the command processor in, pipeline, in, in PowerShell, again, so a core part of, of the language engine. And then, um, and then it's basically up to the host application, so PowerShell.exe in this case, to then take the results of that and do something with it, right? So in the case of PowerShell.exe, usually if there's no error thrown, it'll, you know, it'll, print, uh, it'll print to the host. Um, that's where it's going to redirect its output. Um, so uh, that's actually a pretty uh, important distinction, right? All of this host stuff, so all of the things that happens sort of between the engine being done with executing the code and then until you actually see it in your host application, right? The host application is doing a bunch of stuff that's not part of the uh, partial language engine, right? Uh, like the, the, the colors that PS Readline is enforcing or that your, um, or that the uh, window shell is enforcing when you spin a partial of EXE, for example, System.management.automation.dll, the library that contains the PowerShell core language engine, does not care about this. That's not where that code lives. All of this output marshaling, which color goes where, and again, there's some changes in PowerShell 7.0, but at least between 3.0 and 6, that's all up to the host application. That's not actually part of the language engine. Um, this is sort of this is very interesting sort of interface or, or surface where people don't always understand what is PowerShell of the language engine, what is, or PowerShell of the language, and what is PowerShell of the host application? Where does one stop? Where does one end? It's, it's not always clear, right? I uh, feel like you've shattered my childlike innocence. Because <laughs> I like to be able to go, I type in git dash help, magic happens, right, and right, here's value. Right. Well, the, the, the thing is, uh, so like I've been talking to people about these things for five, six years, and I can safely say that. I still have that sensation sometimes, right? I still write, even in PowerShell, I'll write something and I'm like, oh, magic, it happened, it worked, right? So yeah, don't don't worry too much. <laughs> so if if I'm out there and I'm like, whoa, I've I've just started using the pipeline to like combine commands and I, I can't really follow all this. Um, right. Would it be worth saying that like, okay, hey, understand that there is an engine in every single language you use and it does things. And if you're under needing to dive deeper, that's where you would look. Um, there's also the abstract syntax tree, which is used in your editor. Um, what are some other kind of takeaways that your average Joe, who's not really ready to dive in? I, I, I think I would probably say, don't worry too much about it, right? Like the things we're talking about here are because I know that you, Andrew, are very curious about these things and I'll happily indulge your cu curiosity because I think that's a good thing, right? And I would think that, um, at least a significant a uh, number of your audience might be in a similar situation, right? They're, cur they're curious about PowerShell, how it works and what they can use it for. And so obviously they're interested in hearing from people like me who have invested significant time in sort of looking into that. Uh, that being said, um, if someone is listening to this and just started out, you know, with PowerShell recently or feel like they don't have the requisite experience and that 
everything I'm talking to here sort of doesn't fit with their mental model of what it, whatever they're doing this day, I just want to say that's perfectly fine, right? Uh, it is not a requirement to use PowerShell to be an expert in how it works, right? That this is the case for many things also in IT, right? Um, but if you are curious and if uh, some of these noises I'm making with my mouth sound really interesting and you'd like to dig in, in deeper, then uh, yeah, exploring concepts around uh, the AST uh, and other sort of buzzword that's being thrown up, uh, thrown around because it perhaps gives a better understanding of uh, the runtime and the remoting model would be run spaces, right? So sort of this, the detonation chambers in which we sort of uh, throw our partial hand grenades uh, to, to use a snowboarism. Um, but, uh, but, but that's basically it, right? Like if, if you think these things are, are interesting and you're curious about them, uh, know that there's a lot more to learn out there. And uh, perhaps I should also mention uh, partial is open source, right? Go to github.com slash partial slash partial clone that repository and there's going to be a million lines of code you can start digging into. Um, and so, yeah, if you know just a little bit of C sharp and you want to sort of dig into what's actually going on under the hood, um, that's also an opportunity. Um, it might be a little painful if you're not uh, used to reading a lot of C sharp or not used to navigating large code bases because PowerShell contains a lot of abstractions, right? Again, because we sort of wanted to support an interface with many different subsystems, both in the environment and you want to have some flexibility for things like, um, uh, you know, uh, provider capabilities and so on. Uh, so th there's sort of, there's a lot of jungle to cut down if you start going through the, the code base on your own, but it is there, it is available, right? It's not like something is being kept hidden and you need like secret keys or anything. Um, other than that, I would also say if someone feels super inspired by the conversation we're having here, I'm usually found in the PowerShell Discord, uh, which is bridged with the PowerShell Slack uh, channel, I think. And so if if you join the, the, the PowerShell Slack or Discord channels, then uh, you can try and tag IS Reset Me there and, and see if maybe I'll indulge your curiosity too. It's awesome. Uh, and I think that what is interesting to me about the PowerShell engine is not having a lot of experience with other languages where like maybe I've heard about parsing and all this stuff and I'm very familiar with the concepts. Right. Um, but I think that by kind of, I'm already interested in PowerShell. I want to dive deeper. I'm interested technically. It's a fun thing and it's insightful into other languages. And you see some patterns that you might see repeated. Um, yeah. I, th I think um, PowerShell is extremely powerful in terms of, yeah, sort of like runtime and, and like near real-time visibility, basically. Um, th that's both true in sort of an operational sense. If you're running Windows Server and you're running Windows PowerShell, you can like turn on script lock locking and like you can see what PowerShell is doing to your operating system in real time. But that's not even what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about, like the ability to uh, sort of at will programmatically pass a script and get the AST and start playing with that, right? And then because PowerShell is sort of a powerful interactive command line tool, you can sort of do it step by step sort of by hand, right? Uh, I think that's I think that's really powerful for helping people understand how the language and, and sort of it's sometimes a bit weird semantics work. That is really powerful. And just as you say, I haven't found a lot of, like I found something like it, but I haven't really found it that comprehensively in, in other scripting languages, uh, right? So uh, I, I use Python more than I use PowerShell day to day in my job, for example. Uh, that's you know that's not a personal choice. It just happens that many of the workloads and many of the systems I, I work with uh, happen to interface better with Python, or there's already code uh, for it, or maybe I'm uh, I need to deploy to a runtime that only supports Python. So like Python takes up you know four times as much time for me in my day job than PowerShell does. And one of the things I found is I sort of got deeper into it, started writing tools, started generating code in Python, was that. There are a lot of powerful introspection capabilities in Python, the same as in as in PowerShell and .NET, but the tooling doesn't feel as mature, right? Like I sort of have to, I have to sort of put it together on my own. Like I, I sort of have to DIY most of the tooling when I want to like write a new code generator. And maybe that's just because I, I don't have 10 years of hardcore experience with Python, right? It, it, like it might just be oversight because I'm just not um, uh, familiar enough as I, as I am with PowerShell, but I haven't really seen so, sort of the same, um, yeah, 
runtime visibility and sort of ability to interact with the language engine itself. I, I really haven't seen that anywhere else. So um, yeah, that's that's pretty cool about PowerShell. That is pretty cool. And learning about the abstract syntax tree is quite cool. Um, I have a memory of, I believe, talking to you and Fred at PowerShell Summit 2018 in the lobby on the last day. And I think, honestly, at the time, it was a bit above my head. I think we were talking about either the abstract syntax tree or something about like objects or something. And I just remember like being so enamored, uh, following along with a bit of it and like painting a picture, just such a fun, magical time in my little PowerShell journey. So, so I actually, um, uh, I actually thought about this the other day because, uh, Andrew, you and me met the first time at, uh, at PowerShell summit 18, right? Yeah, I think so. Um, and, and sort of by, by spurious correlation and the fact that we both know Fred, we ended up at sorry, at dinner uh, together the first night, which which was very nice. Um, and then we we went back to the hotel, and Fred had this idea of he wanted me to contribute something that to something he was working on in PS Framework, or he wanted me to test something. And so we went back to the hotel, and we so started hacking on this. And I remember you looking like an eight year old boy on like Christmas Eve. Uh, and I think you said this yourself, right? Like this was the first time you had shown up at like a professional event and people were like, oh, let's have a beer and a hack on stuff in the lobby, right? Like you, you hadn't really experienced anything like this. I just want to highlight that I have also never found that outside sort of like the PowerShell ecosphere. Uh, I've been going to a lot of these events, including PowerShell Summit for the last uh, six, seven years, right? And they, yeah, they really are sort of one, one of a kind, right? It, it's, it's a really weird sort of ecosphere where you can stand in the hallway track and then someone's like, oh, this is really annoying. And then all of a sudden you're like five people who just by accident happens to be the expert in the world on this thing, hacking on this problem together, right? And there's there's sort of a, yeah, I guess that's why people say the hallway tracks are the best at, at these events, right? So it's a time, go ahead, Jordan. I'm I'm very jealous of this. I'm just saying if there's ever a web series of Fred Matias deep dive into a subject, I would pay. I would pay to listen to that. I, I so I think we've we've actually sort of accidentally had this happen at multiple events around the world, right? Like me and Fred usually only meet up like a thousand kilometers from home because we just happen to have been asked to speak at the same event, right? And then and then it's been a while and we start talking and we start we start hacking on something, and sometimes people find it interesting, as was the case when we ran into Andrew. But most of the time, after like ten minutes, people sort of start whittling away, right? <laughs> like it it becomes too nonsensical at some point. Uh, well, so I, I think there, there's maybe also sort of a limit of moderation to, to these technical details. I tell you what, I remember earlier you were describing like as a kid not having like an older uh, cousin or something like that to right. kind of show you these things. And I was kind of at that, like I had external resources, you know, PowerShell in the month lunches, community videos and stuff, but not that many opportunities to just sit and chat with someone who was much had a much better understanding of things and just being able to see that and, and like almost show my brain it's like hey here's what's kind of possible right um, was so so helpful for me yeah i know I completely agree and like i've i've also had that in the past right i um uh, i think it was june blender who told me at some point that uh you need to be aware that there are like multiple distinct learning styles right and you should not you should not sort of take for given what works for anyone else, and that that sort of it blew. I sort of knew it already, but I hadn't really thought about it in those terms. And basically, is what she said, right? There are sort of two major inroads to learning, right? There are the people who like read all the documentation and sort of form a, a good conceptual model of what they're working with, and then they go to work, right? But then there's the, the, the there are like nice fancy terms for these. I, I can't remember what it is, but then the other way around is basically sort of where I feel a little more at home, where you sort of observe the given behavior of a system, right? You, you, like you see a bunch of examples, you sort of play around with what happens when when you start sort of putting these rules to work. And then maybe you go back and review the documentation once you hit a wall, right? Because that's how I learn, right? Like you could ask me to sit down and, and again, like read a comprehensive conceptual 100 page manual. And I'd be like, Bleh after five pages and I would find something else to do, right? Whereas if there's someone around who can be like, just like you said, someone who's maybe a few steps ahead of me already, right? Like we happen to ha have already acquired some of the experience that you were missing at the time, right? So this idea that someone can sort of take you by the hand, give you a gentle introduction with a couple of examples, 
And then just the basic tools so that you can be a little bit dangerous yourself, right? You want just enough of sort of a, a toolbox that you can take it home and then start playing with it, right? Uh, and so uh, I think I think that's actually what makes PowerShell pretty accessible, right? At least at least in my experience, was that the medium of exchange is just text, right? These are just script files, right? So it's basically English, right? Like if I can send you an email, then I can send you some code. And so someone can show me two, three lines of code and I can go home and I can launch PowerShell.exe again, without having to install anything, without having to configure. I don't need to, you know, go through like a complicated wizard for setting up a new project every time I want to do something. Just open the primary application I enter these commands and I see if they do what I expect them to do, right? And then because I'm in this, I'm in this sort of closed feedback REPL loop, I can repeat it, I can change something, I can inspect the output multiple times, I can store it to a variable, that sort of thing, right? And yeah, that 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 to me made PowerShell way more accessible for the sort of learning style that I'm that I'm used to, right? Um, and I've after telling this sort of story to other people, I've heard other people saying, yeah, that was exactly why this, why PowerShell was actually optimal for sort of jumping. Like the learning curve is pretty steep, right? There's a bunch of concepts and a, and a bunch of linguistic concepts in PowerShell that you don't have to be an expert in or sort of know the origin of, but you need to wrap your head around them, right? Like the pipeline is weird, uh, the, right? Like there are many things, regardless of whether you're coming from the command prompt, from C Sharp, from Perl, from some other, from Bash, for example, right? There are some things that make a lot of sense, and there are some things that are just not going to make sense to you, no matter where you come from, and you pick up PowerShell, right? But the fact that sort of the, the feedback cycle, your ability to just repeat and try, so sort of throw your hand grenades, right? Throw your hand grenades into the run space and see what happens. I, th I think that's been a huge enabler. It's been a huge enabler for me, and uh, I, th I think it's been a huge enabler for, for a number of other people, right? Um, it, it doesn't stop once the speaker stops, right? I can take all of these things home and play with myself. It kind of meets you where you are and it, lets it you does, right? yeah. get your hands in. Yeah. With, without the risk of being able to destroy something, are you even learning? Yeah. So, uh, like, that's that's where the whole, that's also sort of the double entendre of the whole, like, hand grenades, snowverism. I, I don't know if you're both familiar with this, right? But, like, the, the greatest snowverism of, of them all is that if 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 C sharp is like programming with a sniper rifle, then PowerShell is like programming with hand grenades, right? And so, like the origin the origin of that expression is that uh, C sharp optimizes for accuracy, and the type system and the runtime in C sharp sort of forces you into optimize for accuracy. Whereas PowerShell is sort of like, oh, we'll do whatever and see what sticks, right? Um, and that's sort of where where the whole thing comes from. And so, in that way, PowerShell is way more forgiving. Right, you can yeah, just throw something at, at it and see what sticks, right? Um, and again, if you're if you're better at reinforcing learning by just doing stuff, that's yeah, it's a way better model than whatever else. That's why what if exists. I think just because of that very thing, it's uh... <laughs> exactly exactly um, yeah. That, that that's another thing you should ask Jeffrey Snover about why what if is part of PowerShell. <laughs> So we mentioned the abstract syntax tree, got some cool stuff there. Um, how do you make use of it? What are you doing with it? Why do you care about it? Like, what are some cool ways that you're kind of tapping into it and seeing things right. and looking at so, it? So so there, I have sort of a few examples. The, the one that sort of comes to mind is uh, PS Profiler, uh, previously known as uh, Script Line Profiler. I think before I took it over. So in when PowerShell 3.0 3.0 came out, so again, this was the first version of Windows PowerShell that has this uh, this engine model that I described, where we generate expression trees from syntax trees. Um, and when 3.0 came out, uh, the whole sort of the API for interacting with the password, the tokenizer, was refreshed. Right, it was rewritten specifically for PS 3.0. And it exposed more of sort of the inots. Um, I, I gave a talk at uh, Partial Summit 2018 called, um, 2019 called uh, Parcel Mouth, I think, uh, which is about introducing new operators in Partial. Parcel right? Tongue, so, wasn't it? Parcel Tongue, right. So um, 
Okay. Uh, the whole talk was basically, okay, PowerShell has a bunch of native operators, right? Dash EQ, um, uh, dash NE, uh, dash uh, not in whatever it is, right? So it has a bunch of these native binary operators. And the question was basically, can we take the PowerShell source code? And then how much code do we need to change, right? How many changes do we need to implement to introduce a new operator that actually has a distinct and sort of meaningful behavior in the language? Uh, for anyone who's interested in this uh, AST stuff and like the language engine components and the whole like lifecycle model that we talked about before, I also highly recommend going back and watching that talk, not just because it's me and it's a great talk, but like that, that might actually show you uh, sort of in context uh, what it's about. And um, uh, so what, one of the things we did in that talk was also very briefly sort of look at the resulting uh, 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 syntax tree or, or the AST. Uh, that result from binary operations in PowerShell. And it actually sort of, uh, there's another point in there about the whole design around AST, meaning that we actually didn't have to change anything. Um, so that's sort of interesting. Uh, What's a binary operation? So a binary operator is an operator that takes two operands. Uh, by, by means two or dual in, in Latin, right? And so a binary operator is simply one uh, that takes two operands. So plus, right, one plus one, uh, it should be it should be noted that plus actually doubles, right? It it also comes in a unary form, so you can do plus and then an expression, and then we'll try to evaluate it as a, as a numeric. Uh, but basically, a binary operator is just any operator that has uh, two operands. So again, plus minus all the arithmetic operators, the containment operators, the um, the equality operators. Uh, yeah, most of them basically, right? Taking us back to math school, man. I like it. <laughs> Well, it's I, th I think it's a good thing, right? Like I I used to I used to be really good at math up until a certain point. I used to be really good at math up to the point where I couldn't do stuff in my head anymore, right? So it's like, and and that that also meant that I had a lot of coping strategies for working out like arithmetic. So I could I could sort of pretty quickly tell you what the result of like a multiplication was, but then you start getting into algebra. Okay, there's some things you can still reduce in your head, but then you start getting into things like um, uh, uh, infinitesimal uh, 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 formulas and that sort of thing, right? It's like calculus. And it's like, okay, I can't do this in my head anymore. What am I going to do? And then I had never, I had never really gotten into the habit of writing things down because I was used to just doing it in my head, anyways. And then you find yourself sort of at an extreme disadvantage when you then reach the inflection point where you actually need to write things things down to get them done. Uh, and so for me, I had to like relearn a lot of math as an adult, as I was learning programming languages, and as I was like learning to solve problems uh, in computers. Uh, I, I don't know if any of you recognize this, this uh, like doing high school math and like having to ask the teacher, what is this all for, right? Like, wh why are you learning? Like, why are we learning about trigonometric like what we we're never going to use this right and so then you have to like relearn all of these things as an adult when you then finally realize that oh there are actually use cases where it's really like it's really important to know some of this math uh, so yeah that's that's also been uh, sort of sort of sort of interesting uh, but back to your question uh, before uh, andrew uh, about uh, what i've been using the the ast for um when partial 3.0 came out um it came with a set of SDK samples. SDK stands for Software Development Kit, right? And so an SDK is basically a bundle of software, including all the libraries that contain the libraries that you want to uh, that you want to uh, code against, and then any sort of helper tooling. And so in this case, the S the uh, the partial SDK, which is just System Management Automation DLL and a bunch of XML files. When that came out, it came out with something called a sample pack. And the sample pack had a bunch of like Visual Studio projects, like different different applications or different libraries that had been written as examples of how to interact with, with PowerShell, the new language API. And one of them was called uh, Script Line Profiler. It was put together by uh, Jason Shirk, the guy who also rewrote the language engine for 3.0 and came up with this idea of turning the abstract syntax trees into expression trees. And he basically said, oh, Actually, there's a really good opportunity for showing how you can use the AST to rewrite functionality at, at runtime, basically. And so uh, what he tries to do with Scriptline Profiler is he 
takes a piece of code that you want to profile, right? You want to measure the performance characteristics of a, of, of a piece of code. Maybe you're suspecting that it's slow, but you're not quite sure which statement, which line of code uh, am, I, am I looking to sort of optimize away here. And so you take you take your script or a piece of code, uh, you feed that uh, you feed that to it. It feeds it through the parser and takes the and takes the AST that the parser then returns, and then he starts rewriting the AST. That is the abstract syntax tree. Let's say for an operation like one plus one, the abstract syntax tree consists of three nodes, right? Three leaves. There's an operator the plus operator, and then it has two leaf nodes attached to it, the actual values that it's going to, to use as operands, right? So the abstract syntax tree for, for the operation one plus one would sort of be a triangle, right? Where at the top you have the operator and then you sort of have the leaf nodes, right? Um, I almost lo lost my, my train of thought here. I'm just trying to catch up here again. Um, so basically, you, uh, you feed that in, you get the AST out, and then uh, uh, the AST, what he what he does basically is he takes these individual leaf nodes and then he replaces them with new expressions, right? He replaces them with new sort of subtrees in this AST. And these replaced components, these replaced leaf nodes, basically what they are is they're a copy of themselves with a statement that stops a stopwatch uh, on top of it, and then a statement underneath that stops the stopwatch and emits or collects how long uh, how long it took to to execute that particular line of code. So basically, what he he's doing in in um, in the background is without touching your code on disk, without touching your script, he's just injecting a bunch of statements before and after every line, right? And then he uses the results and execution of this code that he's injected to uh, to be able to say that a particular line took so and so long to execute. As opposed to measure uh, measure command, where you sort of just get a full execution time, right? And so this this is sort of crazy, right? That you could take some source code that you have some expectation about how it's working, right? You can turn it into the AST, this sort of in memory representation of what the computer needs to execute next, and then you can rewrite that in place and then make the execution tree be completely different, right? In this case, it wasn't that different. Again, we're sort of just like we're doing a little extra before and after each statement. Um, but yeah, that, that's it is sort of crazy, right? And um, the problem with the sample pack uh, uh, example was that it was broken. It was like a couple of there was a couple of like uh, uh, logic uh, like bugs in it, so you could you could compile it and you could run it, and it either wouldn't give you a result or it would throw like a nonsensical error. And then at some point, I don't know, five, six, seven years ago, uh, someone in the uh, partial group on Facebook. There used to be like a huge community. Uh, there might still be there. But there was like a huge community of like 10,000 people on Facebook who were all into PowerShell. And one of the admins uh, proudly announced one day that he had ported it to PowerShell as a uh, way to showcase classes, um, which is also something we can talk about. But I'm going to skip skip over that for now. But basically, the idea was that can we have a showcase for uh, uh, classes in Windows PowerShell that inherit from or um, or make use of existing .NET uh, code or, or or partial libraries, and so he basically took the C sharp, he rewrote it in the syntax of PowerShell, and then he he pushed it to GitHub. Of course, the PowerShell script had the exact same flaw as the original code, so that also didn't work. Okay, so now we have two versions of this insanely useful tool that nobody can make work. Um, so I took the PowerShell version of it, the, the one that had been ported from C sharp. Um, I've analyzed, debugged it, uh, fixed it, uh, added some more functionality to it, and then I published it under a new name, PS Profiler, on the PowerShell gallery. Uh, so yeah, if if you're interested in sort of shallow syntactical profile uh, performance profiling of your scripts, uh, PS Profiler um, is definitely something you should check out. Install module PS Profiler, um, but beyond that, it might also be a, a good sort of study uh, in sort of the minimal code you need to to modify or or um, uh, or manipulate the AST. Uh, that would be a, a great example of that, yeah. That's really cool. And it's funny you mentioned that because uh, at this job, I submitted a PR with a PowerShell script and it wasn't very performant. And the evidence used to show me like, hey, here's kind of what you need to look on was PS Profile. And I was like, Excellent. hey, that's cool. Excellent, <laughs> getting some mileage out in the real world. I really have to do that. Exactly. So I, just, I had to use uh, spaces, so. Yeah, I, I, I do want to say though, um, 
uh, piece profile is not like it was a really fun tool to write and like again i think it's pretty interesting sort of as a as a showcase for a for a sort of simple ac manipulation um if you're in all seriousness if you need like proper performance profiling of like the runtime behavior of your partial scripts uh, uh check out uh, jakob yar's uh, profiler so just drop the ps install module profiler um, uh, he's basically written a module that does actual performance profiling instead of just injecting like a bunch of stopwatch code, which is what we're sort of the, the naive approach we're, we're doing with PS Profiler. He's actually extracting um, sort of like runtime uh, information from uh, PowerShell in real time as it's executing. So you get more, uh, more narrow mes measurements, right? They're a little less jittery. There's not too much overhead. Um, but you also get uh, performance profiling beyond the syntactical level, right? The problem with PS Profiler is that if there's one command, one statement in your script that takes up 99% of the time, but it's because of a complication further down in the library, right? Like you're hitting some performance performance stopgap because of the input or whatever it is, right? You're never going to see that. The output from PS Profiler is go just going to tell you like, yeah, that line is really slow, right? Like otherwise it wouldn't have taken 99% of the total execution time. So if you want to sort of dig deeper and see slow, so like why is it slow? Then profiler is definitely what you want to what you want to go for. Some fun stuff right there. So it's uh, it's always interesting. I've always been, I don't know, surface level. I'm I'm happy it works and I'm happy to go and make it. Work. So it's, I'm always just interested to hear when people dive into the back end and they go real deep because. You're always going to be able to do more with that, and it's just interesting. But it's just, I mean, it goes it goes over my head so quick. I, I'm I, I am happy to accept the surface level. I feel like that's still very useful, but there is a lot in there. Absolutely right. Like as I said before, right? Like ninety nine percent of the of the people who who might listen to this this conversation will ever have a need for it, right? I did it because I thought it was interesting, and then I keep talking about it because other people also think it's interesting, but they don't necessarily want to have to sort of dive headfirst into it uh, as well, right? And they don't need to, uh, right? These are these are sort of um, deep technical curiosa. They're not for everyone. I'm actually yeah. going to go watch your your talk from 2019 though, just because I am I am curious to see if I can do that for a long term. Because I mean, I, I said I like to say surface level, but if I find a, an avenue that's comfortable for me to dive deep, I mean, it's not going to hurt to learn, right? Yeah, for sure. I think uh, actually, like, I should, I should be a little bit careful here because, like, there's also a bunch of stuff that has changed the partial language engine. So I should probably go back and check whether it's it's still relevant for like the partial seven point three. Uh, but I suspect that you should probably be able to to, to get some mileage out of, out of it still. So, yeah. Even if there are changes, I imagine a lot of the core concepts behind it still work. I could just reapply it. It it is, and also the like the parts of the the engine that I'm I'm talking about and that I'm touching in that talk, they don't change that often, right? Like we might add new functionality again, like new operators, uh, new keywords, whatever it is, right? So there might be additions to that part of the language engine, sort of the the parsing, the the linguistics part of of the engine. Um, but structurally, it almost never changes, right? Like it hasn't changed much in terms of like the architecture uh, of the API since, yeah, PowerShell 3.0, basically. Yeah, Jordan, if you want to dive deep in it, I think, I think for most things, finding a reason, like kind of like with math you were talking about earlier, Matthias, it's like, why am I going to learn this stuff in high school or whatever yeah. when I don't really have use? Now we're doing stuff we kind of care about or interested in, have already invested some skills. Oh, wow. I kind of need to remember the difference between an operator and an operand because the documentation refers to that kind of thing. And it's now right. part of your lexicon. Right. And and now you're trying to go to the next level. Oh, now you need to be aware of some certain math rules. And you know, yeah. it's easier to learn when there's kind of a reason to learn. Absolutely. And and that's, that's also why it's natural that you sort of learn as you go along, right? So, you know, you... Like you're reading the documentation, for example, right? You're reading one of the about pages or whatever, and then some pretentious person like myself put something like that there, right? Like it, that requires you to know the difference between operand and operator, right? But then either it makes sense contextually, or that's the point at which you look it up anyways, and then you probably know the next time, or at least once you've done that two or three times, right? Um, and again, that that sort of also fits my my own personal learning style perfectly. We learn as we go along, and we reinforce by doing it again. Right? 
also with PowerShell, there's not that whole, like you were mentioning earlier, need for that formal training. Like, yeah, you probably need to know a couple of these things, but it's not like there's a hundred before you can get started. It's oh, like sure you'll not. be doing something and you'll run into one kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, yeah. And I again I I personally found that it's been useful to have some both conceptual and hands on on sort of knowledge of other programming languages, particularly a programming language running on the, on the same framework, right on the same platform. Um, but but I don't I don't think that's a prerequisite of, at all, right? Um, that that also wasn't how I how I had adopted PowerShell. Uh, no, exact, exactly as you say, right? Um, um, you pick it up, you throw some hand grenades, see what sticks. I like that how you're you're a big fan of just those some hand grenades, see what sticks, while also getting extremely granular into the why. Like you you you're adding precision to your hand grenades. <laughs> Again, I, I also think, as I said, right, like I have found it personally valuable to know about some of these things, right? Even though I'm, I might not be an ex expert uh, uh, in either computer science or software development, having some background and having some uh, some sort of hands-on hands experience has really helped uh, me also think about how I use PowerShell, right? And the other way around, right? So I said before, right, like these days I, I do mostly Python. I still do some C sharp once in a while. I might write some Go. And sometimes I'll like switch between projects and I'll also take things from one language into the other with me, right? It's like, oh, I was able to successfully apply a particular design pattern or a, a particular um, sort of architecture for for a small application or whatever it is in one language, maybe I can sort of try to apply it over here. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work because, you know, languages are differently. Otherwise, we would just have one, right? Um, and so, you know, maybe, maybe sometimes I'll try to like recreate something I did last week in PowerShell in Python and then find out after 10 hours that like, oh no, this is actually really stupid. I, like there's a, there's a better way to do it in Python already. I shouldn't be, re you know, I shouldn't be reinventing the same solutions over here. Uh, but yeah, being a little bit of a polyglot definitely sort of helps you uh, at least just having a bigger arsenal when you find a new problem that you need to work around, right? Sometimes in PowerShell, I just throw in some extra spaces just to flex at Python. <laughs> yes, yeah, see, see if uh, <laughs> if it'll take it. <laughs> Question. So, Jordan, you mentioned that it kind of gets confusing when we talk about a lot of the stuff, and I, I agree with you, and I bet a lot of people at home is. But what I think that for me, what I think makes it kind of confusing is there's so many kind of pieces that you have to be familiar with before you can kind of have it all make sense and not have to spend brain power like kind of remembering, oh, wait, what is this? Oh, yeah. So just overexposure and time, I think that it, it'll become easier. It's not like some kind of you have it or you don't. You're either smart enough to follow this all or you're not. It's more like no, no, overexposure. Yeah, it, it'll all kind of, oh, yeah. It, it, it's, it's one of those like with AST, it's an interesting concept, but to follow along, especially if you've never looked into it, read up on it before, following along yeah. with just words is, yeah, I don't know, to me, not, not imaginable. I, I'm going to have to go and play with it before a lot of this clicks for me. For sure. Good to know but, that it exists, though. But, but I also think, just like you said, Andrew, right, like, th this has been my partial experience, right? Like, it's a continuous series of, like, click moments, right? And so sometimes some of them unclick and something else clicks, right? But it is like, it is like a continuous journey of, like, having these sort of, oh, oh maybe that's how it works, actually, right? Uh, I, I think I was, I'd been using partial for maybe five or six years before I went, I can't remember if I was like at a conference or a meetup or something like that. And someone as an introduction to their talk about some module they, they've been writing, um, they said, just to recap, right? There's just like a five minute recap of like base assumptions here. And so they proceed to show a very simple graphic in which they imagine the partial pipeline or the pipeline processor um, as, um, uh, as a moving assembly belt, right? And so each command is like a machine atop the assembly belt or a robot next to the assembly belt. And it takes as input whatever comes in from the left. And then it pushes perhaps some output out on the right. And then the next robot on the assembly line picks it up and so on and so on. And then he sort of got into explaining, uh, like with that as its, as its basis, started then explaining how pipeline binding, uh, pipeline type binding works, right? So, you know, how does PowerShell figure out whether 
uh, that a string should be like bound to the path parameter, but if you give it a file object, it's just input object and then power, right? Like all of these things, right? And again, I had been using PowerShell for like five or six years and thought I had like an okay-ish decent understanding of why the pipeline semantics work the way they work. And it completed, it was like the simplest graphic and the simplest explanation ever. And half the people in the meetup seemed to have that same mental model. They were all like, yeah, 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 that's how the PowerShell pipeline works. I had never thought about it in that way. And it like, it, this is also one of these like, oh, three things on click, but then five more things click all of a sudden, right? Uh, so yeah. All right, Matisse, uh, every, every guest we have, we like to hammer them with just difficult questions. We call the segment <laughs> common parameters. Uh, you know, we, we tried to dial it back a little bit because it has been so traumatizing for some of our guests that they actually have changed as people. So are you ready to try to tackle the common parameters? Let me say, Jordan, I won't be readier. So let's go. <laughs> All right, and you know, I'm going to change up the order. I'm I'm, I'm adding some zazz to it. All right. What What are your three favorite modules? Uh, the built-in utility module is my absolute number one favorite module. You know, select object, group object, all that stuff. Like it's basic, but like it fuels my my PowerShell life. Uh, yeah, the utility module for sure. Um, Number two, I would actually pick out Jakob's profiler module that I sort of was sort of shilling before, uh, because he sort of he he picked it up as a bit of a challenge. There were some things I didn't want to do with PS profiler, and he was like, "Well, I can do it better better myself." And he really ran with it and came up with this this amazing module. Uh, so yeah, um, uh, uh, the profiler module, and then finally um, Patrick Meinke's class explorer. Uh, Class Explorer is um, is uh, is a module that basically sort of allows you to work around um, some um, some reflection problems, uh, making it easier to discover types in the types in .NET type system. So if you want to figure out like how many types are currently loaded in the runtime that implements a particular interface or has a particular function with this name and this signature, then you just um, just use like a find command from from Classic Floor, and then it'll find it for you. Uh, I find that really it makes it it makes it a lot easier to do things that sort of yeah uh, ha ha happen to to deal with exploration of .NET type system in, in PowerShell, which happens to be something I'm interested in. Jordan, yeah. he reached our daily double. He <laughs> gave us three modules we've never gotten before. Ding ding ding! <laughs> we have a Woo! winner! Wow, amazing! And I don't know. I don't know how I feel about you uh, touting. You, you, I'm going to call him your competitor. Your competitor's m module over your own, but uh, we'll allow it. <laughs> That's PowerShell community for you, right? <laughs> All right. Are you ready for the second common parameter? Hit me. Right. What's one time something went real wrong at your job? How did you handle it, and what did you learn from it? Oh dear God, this list is going to be long. You just you just want one thing? It just what's the latest hand grenade you lobbed? Okay, okay. Uh, so I think the biggest hand grenade I ever lobbed was um, in, this has been in 2011 or 2012. So yeah, 10 years ago, I was, um, I was working at the MSP. I was looking after a bunch of exchange server organizations uh, on behalf of, uh, there was a guy sitting sort of behind me who was the exchange master at our, our company. He designed most of the setups. Uh, he designed most of the maintenance procedures, a lot of the scripting and so on. He really knew what he was talking about. But he was on vacation for two weeks, and he asked me, because there was no one else around, he asked me, can you look after some of these customers? And I know there's going to be like a couple of cleanup tasks after a big migration for this particular customer over here. Is that something I can entrust you with? And I was like, of course, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. And so in my eagerness to show how effective, like what a great choice he had done entrusting me with this job, uh, I took up the first task, which was to clean up a bunch of temporary storage after like a mailbox state space migration. And the like the task was super simple. Dismount the temporary storage, uh, have a look at the monitoring for like 30 minutes to make sure that everything works, and then decommission the underlying lawn in, in the storage network. Uh, so the, like it really was like just like click these five buttons and wait a little bit, basically. 
but I was really eager to show like just how fast and how quick I could do this. So I I wrote like uh, not a partial script, but like I, I wrote like a bunch of command prompts, like batch commands basically to like execute all of these steps really quickly, including uh, purging the storage, dismounting the lawn, so on and so on. Then because I wanted to be double effective, and again, I was being a young and naive idiot here, I executed it on both mailbox servers like we had, it was like a DAC, right? So there would be a standby, standby mailbox server and there would be an active, very simple, simple active, sta uh, active standby DAC. And so I executed this on the, on the standby node and then immediately proceeded to also execute it on the active node. And then I went to lunch. And so when I came back from lunch 20 minutes later, when I should have been looking at the, the monitoring really, uh, I might've noticed that uh, there was like, 10 new critical like p1 tickets on this customer and they all had to do with like leadership like c-level executives not being able to access their mailboxes and what i then found after a little bit of panicking and a little bit of digging was that the week prior so in between this guy going on vacation and me picking up this task someone else had temporarily moved the mailbox database storage for all the c-level executives at the company to these temporary disks while they were cleaning up after another migration. And you know, they left a note somewhere saying, like, oh, remember to, my, remember to migrate these back to primary storage before decommissioning this. Of course, I didn't read this note because I was eager to just get done really quickly. So I got done really quickly. And again, because I was so overzealous, uh, having also purged the underlying storage. There was no way to just like remount them, right? Like if I just dismounted the storage, I could just remount it and we would be back up again. But I had purged the underlying storage because I thought I was being smart. And uh, the result was that I spent the next 36 hours trying to restore their mailbox databases. It turns out that the scripts we had in place for performing differential backups of these mailbox databases was incorrectly configured. So you couldn't auto restore when the di differential backups had been taken on different nodes. And we would usually switch like these DAC mailbox uh, groups like uh, between nodes during the week for maintenance purposes, right? So that meant that we had all of these broken backup chains that you had to stitch together by hand basically a week at a time using ESE Util. So I got really good at using ESE Util, the CLI for, for date space main maintenance in Exchange. And I learned a lot about ESE that I wish I could unlearn. Uh, and I, yeah, after 36 hours, I finally managed to like get the last mailbox database up. Um, and I remember going home and just sleeping for 24 hours. Again, like I'd, I've been on the job at this point for, for like almost two days straight. I went home, I slept. Uh, my boss called me into his office the next day and I was, I was fearing that, you know, this was my last day at the job basically. And he said, uh, the the customer, the, so the people whose you know C-level executives got impacted by this uh, by this incident are all based in Japan, and I've been told that due to sort of the honor-bound professional culture, uh, I am obliged to fire you. And I said, <laughs> oh, oh, well, you know, I I'm sorry it has to end like this, but you know, this, I had I also sort of had to own my mistake. So I said, well, I'm really sorry to hear that, but if that's the way it is, then that's the way it is. And my boss looked at me and he sort of winked and he said, so the next time you work on that customer, ask Brian over here to do the ticket updates. <laughs> um, so I think there's sort of there were two or three things I learned sort of out out of this experience actually. Uh, one, it's really great to have a supportive boss, right? Like. My boss knew that I had not done this out of malice or what he was, he was perfectly understanding of the fact that I was just overzealous and a naive young idiot. And we all make mistakes. And he was ready. Uh, the second I admitted my mistake, and again, also having sort of owned up and tried to fix it myself, uh, he was ready. He was ready to forgive me, basically. And that made for a way safer uh, sort of psychological work environment, right? It made it way, way easier than in the future to admit, oh, I kind of, I kind of messed up over here, right? I made my mistake. Uh, the other thing I learned was that uh, I should also get better at asking for help, right? Because as I just mentioned, I spent 36 hours on my own stitching uh, backup, uh, uh, incremental backups back together and sort of rehydrating these databases. And 
it would have taken a long time and I probably also would have insisted on doing it myself, you know, having been the one who messed up in the first place. But I should have asked some of my colleagues to help me, right? I was, I was, you know, so they, my pride was a little bit hurt and I didn't really want to admit sort of how it was getting to me. So I was like, no, just let me buck down and like, I'll fix my mistake myself. But I think like the second lesson I took out of that was definitely just eat your pride and, and ask for help, right? Such a good piece of advice. Um, I find that like being proactive and asking questions and communicating with your team and stuff like that is a great way to like sort of guide your team in the right direction without needing to be a manager or without telling everyone like, hey, here's how we need to do things. For it's sure. just like you open the door for so many other people to ask questions, yeah. to give you an answer, or it's surprising how many good things can come from just being more vocal. Yeah, I've, uh, I've, I've talked... I've talked with a bunch of other community uh, sort of contributors at large about this, and um, we haven't really got into it. But like my my primary sort of partial community contributions are through Stack Exchange, right? Through Stack Overflow, um, in the form of I think we're up to like three and a half thousand answers I've written on Stack Overflow over the last ten years, specifically uh, Tech Tech PowerShell, right? And um, People sometimes sometimes ask me, you know, sort of like, what motivates you, or why why are you doing this? And there's a bunch of selfish reasons for it, right? Like, I get a kick out of it, right? Like, I the same way people are, you know, the same way I'm addicted to smoking cigarettes, I'm also addicted to solving programming problems that other people are having right here and right now. It's a really weird addiction, but uh, it's one I have, and like I feed it using tools like Stack Overflow or the the DevOps forums or whatever, wherever else people post their weird problems and what they can do to solve them. Uh, but the other part of it is also what I was talking about before, right? Like having struggled with sort of um, being able to just swallow your pride, ask other people for help or, or, or ask questions, right? I can't solve that problem for anyone else. Uh, but if someone actually sort of overcomes that fear, overcomes that anxiety and has the goal to ask a question, I want them to be met with a proper response, right? I want people to be rewarded for actually asking earnest questions. And so me answering three, 4,000 questions about PowerShell is not just about me wanting fake internet points. It's also about encouraging a, sort of a community where people are rewarded for asking questions. I, I really like seeing that. That's awesome. We always are preaching about, hey, get out there, you know, write some blogs, other people will see them. And that's well and good, but there's many different ways you can communicate. That can be inside your work channels, be an advocate for automation and PowerShell and communicating and you know, lead the way. Absolutely. I mean, I also, I also put in that the things I learn and sort of the things I practice are better reinforced when I teach them to other people, right? It sort of forces me to think about like how I articulate the thing we're talking about. So, so like, it's really good for sort of cementing your own learning, right? Um, and so, uh, yeah, like I've also gotten a lot out of that, right? Like just the aspect teaching people PowerShell. Also, I'm, I'm also teaching myself PowerShell along the way, right? Definitely. Great stuff. Are you ready for your third and final common parameter? Give it to me. All right. Uh, with with what you know now, uh, what's one tip you would give your younger self when first starting in IT, other than properly migrating mailboxes before uh, disabling <laughs> devices? Yeah, other than uh, other than exchange related advice, uh, I would probably say. Um, your job for. for for most of us, at least for those of us who are salaried by an employer, right, which again is, is probably most of, of your audience, um, the job might be your employer's, but your career is yours, right? And that might sound very nice and inspiring or whatever, but it's actually, I'm, I'm actually sort of asking you to take action here uh, because nobody else is going to drive your career forward for you, right? Other people might help afford you opportunities and, and so on and so on. But there's only one person uh, responsible for developing your own career, and that's you. Um, it it took me a long time to realize that I should just stand around and wait for someone else to tell me what I was allowed to do, or you know, what questions I could answer, or uh, what opportunities I could take. Right? Um, you you really are the master of your own career, and the the faster you learn that, and also the faster you learn that it's 
it's not necessarily the same as your job, right? Those two are, are sort of widely disconnected sometimes, actually. Um, th that is definitely something I would try to impress on my younger self. I don't think I'd listen, but I would try to impress it on my younger self, for sure. That's some great advice. I think that's a, a common thing, though. It's like, I don't think younger me would listen to older me. No, no. <laughs> no but, 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 yeah. I, I, I think you mentioned it. We all learn different ways. Right. Yeah, so sometimes sure. people want to just go up in there, make the mistakes, read the documentation and uh, figure it out. Um, I, I think it's a great point you bring up, though, about the career thing, because when we talk about being public and trying to do more, you know, that is taking ownership of your career, making these relationships with people at conferences, whether that be virtual or in person. I mean, this is your career. And to me, I, I like that distinction that you made because definitely I, work is an important thing, but there's more to it than just that job that you have. Right, right. And it, it also, it, it, again, yeah, I really sort of want to impress the whole, like there's not a one-to-one -one overlap with your job thing, right? Like I've been asked by a couple of people when, you know, prior to the pandemic, and this is also how we met each other, right, uh, Andrew, I spend a lot of my spare time traveling the world and talking PowerShell with people because I really enjoy that, right? Uh, and uh, obviously, the last three years have not been super conducive to doing just that. But but prior to that, that literally was what I spent most of my vacation time on. And I also spent a significant amount of my own money on it, right? Uh, because, you know, flying out to the US, flying out to Asia, flying around Europe uh, to speak at meetups, uh, many of which are volunteer um, uh, led, right? It's not like there's a big budget for flying people in uh, all over the world. Um, people would ask me, right, like how, you know, either how, how do you afford it or why do you do it? And the answer is pretty simple, right? Like I felt like I was getting something out of it, right? And it did not necessarily translate into me getting a promotion at work. It also did not necessarily, although indirectly sort of translate into my CV being worth more, right? If I, if I go to take a, a gig at a company who wants to hire me specifically for my partial proficiency, then it might be useful, right? But that that's also not the primary aim of these things, right? The primary aim for me was that I kept being excited in aspects of my career. I kept meeting interesting people like yourselves, right? And I had things I could take home with me and that I could play with either professional or, 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 or in my spare time. And so that that was a choice of investment in my own life, right? So again, people come up to me and like, oh, I would never spend my own money, you know, like traveling to an event like this. This is for professionals or whatever. It's like, that's fine, right? Like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna tell you to spend any money. I'm just saying that this is what I do in my spare time because I actually enjoy it, right? Uh, don't, don't let anyone else dictate to you what you should enjoy or how you should sort of bend your career or, uh, or your spare time, right? Mm -hmm. I think that by being involved like you have, maybe it hasn't like gotten you your current job or whatever, but I feel like by being, by putting yourself out there, there are, are more people who have seen the general way you conduct yourself and generally how you might be sort of as a coworker and you for probably a lot of people are like, oh, hey, he's not going to be terrible to work with. In fact, there's probably a lot of things that I would enjoy about working with him. That, and maybe that, you that even is, know some people that are hiring at some point. That is definitely a plus. Absolutely. Like I, I don't want to, um, I don't want to sort of brush it away, um, but it, it's just not, it's just not the primary thing, right? Like right. as long as I can keep, keep sort of happy doing both what I do professionally and also sort of outside, even though the two sometimes overlap, as long as I, I can sort of keep feeding my own curiosity, then it's worth it for me, right? It means that I'm a happier human being and, you know, um, that's also worth investing in. Maybe that would actually be like the number one piece of advice, right? Like it really isn't a bad thing to invest in your own happiness or your own wellness, right? Uh, yeah. Have you ever tried applying the extra, how much extra salary would it take for you to move to a job where you weren't happy? You mean like how long would it take from when I had like my first day until I like put, like put in my resignation? Uh, so, no, so if you're making, uh, well, just rent, you're making 50,000 and, right. and you're you loving that job, you're very happy there. What what type of job where you knew you would lose a lot of that happiness? How much money would it take before? What's I guess what's the price of happiness? I guess is what I'm asking, right? right. I think uh, that that question probably makes a lot more sense in the US, 
um, <laughs> and I think and so like, the, the reason is that uh, the my current employer, for example, offered me less than I was making at my previous employer, and I still took the job, right? And the reason for that is that it afforded me an opportunity to relo relocate abroad to a place where I actually wanted to live. Um, it afforded me um, it afforded me a lot of great colleagues, um, some of many of whom, whom I still have, by the way. Um, and so, it really didn't have anything to do with money at all, right? Like again, I took a pay cut to change my life situation significantly, and what I got out of it was again a sense of, as I said before, sort of taking control of my own career a little more, right? By not just going for you know whatever whatever can I get get salary wise out of this, but also doing something that I actually enjoy and working with people that I enjoy. Um, so I, I think yeah, um, so money 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 is like the th thing number three or number four or number five down the list when I evaluate uh, like compensation at an at an employer. Um, it's things like uh, if anyone wants me to work more than forty hours a week, then we don't have a deal. Right, like I, I, I even forty-eight hours. I'm not going to do it. Um, Work-life work yeah. balance is pretty important. That's a big it is. Thing. It is important, right? Um, it's important that either uh, they're located near where I live, or I can work remotely the majority of the time. Right, that's also important to me. I don't want to be stuck in a commute somewhere. Uh, also, not something I want to waste my life on. Um, and. And then obviously I want to work with people solving interesting problems in a safe environment, right? I talked a little bit about this before, right? So if like knowing that your boss has, has your back as, as long as you're being honest with them, right? That means the world to me to know that even if I mess up, because I'm gonna mess up at some point, like we all are, right? Um, I'm not gonna be hung out to dry, uh, to dry or, or be thrown on the, bu the bus by, by some psychopathic manager somewhere. Uh, and then, once I have, once I feel like that's possible, then we can talk salary, right? But if 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 all of these things aren't met, right, like, and that's the reason that the job is going to be shitty, I'm not going to entertain it. And if you if you come and offer me a million dollars a year to do a job like that, I'm probably going to call the police because you're probably in some sort of punzi fraud or whatever. Like that doesn't sound right. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I'm in a similar boat. I would, I just couldn't do it long term. There's just no need. Like maybe it'd be worth it for a few months of like a super high salary of like whatever, you know. But um, yeah. Right. So that's it, a different thing, right? Like if if some if if something was time boxed, right? If someone comes and says like, listen, we have this really annoying problem that we need to solve. We think you would be the perfect uh, guy to do it. There's some organizational dysfunction here. Your job is basically just come in, solve this problem for the next six months, maybe three months extension, and then you're out of here then I might be willing to, like, again, if I can see sort of like light at the end of the tunnel, I might be able to, I might be willing to accept uh, an, an excessive salary uh, to accept a position like that. Uh, but uh, yeah, as, a, as long term as a as permanent uh, job, I, yeah, no, I don't think so. I think, uh, I think the, the two of you probably have a healthier outlook than I do. <laughs> I'm, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna dive deep on to, to where I land on that because that probably will make me look pretty ugly. I, I like money. I do. Oh, for sure. <laughs> I also. I also like money, right? But it, I. I also just found that. I mean, I did this the first five, yeah, five, six, seven years of my career. I also sort of chased, uh, you know, getting the next salary increase, getting more bonuses, taking more overtime, doing travel, whatever would unlock getting more money into my bank account. And I. I, I completely understand that, right? But it gets to a point, or it got to a point where, I mean, I'm not interested in big cars, right? Like, I'm not going to buy a Rolls Royce. I'm not, like, I, I'm not a fancy luxury spender. I don't, I don't have a high-maintenance girlfriend who needs a new Louis Vuitton, right? Like, money as an object in itself is not that interesting to me. Being able to do the things I want to do and being able to, you know, put nice food on the table obviously motivates the, the accrual of money. Um, but for me, it got to a point where around... Uh, I don't know if this translates well with the current sort of currency evaluation across the world, uh, but let's say at seventy at seventy thousand US dollars, there was like a cutoff point, seventy five maybe. There was like a cutoff point where actually it didn't do anything, right? Like 
it wouldn't have made a huge difference to get a five, ten thousand dollar increase. And it actually wouldn't have it actually wouldn't have made that much of a difference to get a twenty five thousand dollar increase uh, annually, right? Because I had gotten to a point where I could cover my mortgage, I could cover everything I need to eat, I can uh, buy the cigarettes I'm addicted to, right? Like I could sort of cover all all the bases. I had enough left over to be able to travel around the world and talk partial with people like you, and I had enough for like a vacation once in a while, or you know, splurging a bit on. Um, like a fancy new musical instrument or a new TV or something like that. And after that point, yeah, okay, like 10% more money is only going to make me 0.1% happier, right? Yeah, the things that are going sense. to make me happy are having my friends over and, you know, serving them some nice dinner that I paid a bunch of money for, right? Um, so, yeah, at, at some point, I feel like the the money to happiness sort of linear ratio, it sort of it stagnates pretty, pretty sharply. I guess I guess that's a fair point. There there is a number that I think where when, once uh, concern goes away, that it yeah. loses value quickly. Maybe I don't I don't know if it loses value, but it the other way around. It's very much less painful if you took it out of the of the um, of the equation, right? Yes. Right. I'm, I'm sure. Question. No, hold on. Yeah. Oh, you, we're going to keep going. I, I got to get into it. He said something. I love it when, uh, when our guests bring up something that I harp about all the time, and that was safety. You mentioned, like, if it's not safe to make mistakes, if I'm not free to blah, blah, blah. Like, to me, that stuff is so important. And um, I'm not sure what every workplace is like out there, but my general impression is that there aren't actually that many places that are, like, safe growth type places where people are not kind of pretending to have it all figured out all the time. Right, right. I... I've probably been pretty lucky. I've only I've only had like I've had less than a handful of employers in my in my adult life, basically. Um, and I've also been uh, lucky to sort of work on the floor or at least alongside people from a number of other companies, just because of the nature of the work I was doing, right? Because of doing uh, again, sort of starting out doing ops work, but then doing consultancy for big companies, helping them develop develop better. Uh, operating procedures and best practices, that sort of thing, right? Um, and I think it's absolutely true that it's definitely not a given that you can expect uh, sort of a, a safe psychological uh, working environment. There are a lot of crappy companies out there and there are a lot of crappy bosses out there, right? <laughs> Lots of crappy managers. Um, but I've, I just, I've been lucky that most of the managers I've had also value that, so, that sort of safety, right? Um, and the contrast between the experiences I've had with managers who think that they either don't have any responsibility, like they don't have an obligation to make me feel safe at work, right? Like the only obligation is to watch the company making money or whatever. Uh, the contrast I've observed between these types of bosses have been very stark. And I'm, I feel pretty confident saying now at the age of 32 that my life is too short for bosses who, you know, unnecessarily and deliberately instill a, a toxic culture right um like i don't i don't have the time for it agreed agreed um i i think that yeah if you're in a workplace right now where you don't have that safety um and, and maybe you're you know i think that number one it's important to identify that the business is ultimately suffering from that dysfunction so it's in everyone's best interest to kind of get on the same page. And if you're in a position where you can influence the culture or at least within your own team, kind of help to start provide, providing that safety and modeling the behavior that, you know, maybe your team should do, uh, you know, you should try and do what you can while taking care of yourself. Because yeah. um, if you want to be at your best and you want your teams to do as best as they can, they need to be taken care of, feel safe, have the appropriate tools, so on and so forth. I mean, I, I have a boss right now where um, uh, it, it it doesn't happen as, as often as it used to, but like I could call him up tomorrow morning and say, uh, listen, dude, I've only slept an hour and a half because I was up all night obsessing about some stupid problem that isn't even for work. Uh, and my boss is going to be like, it's all right, right? Like I'll see you in the afternoon. Um, and that that's sort of the sense of trust and being again being able to be completely open and honest or at least sort of pretty pretty close to uh with your line manager or with your uh your your peers and your team i think that's incredibly important right like that nothing has done more to reduce my stress levels at work than knowing 
that I'll be heard and I won't be sort of wrung out unnecessarily if I if I'm just being honest with my boss, right? Um, so yeah, if you're a boss out there, I'll I'll definitely encourage sort of that that sense of uh, of safety and trust. Well, well my my boss Ed is this, and I hope I hope he listens, Kelly. <laughs> So I don't know if you've heard, I mean, this, but Andrew is world class when it comes to shilling a product. It's I've it's, heard so, yeah, yeah. So the, the problem that I've run into is many people have approached me and said, "How come you're not giving real world examples? You're just coming up with this fantastical <laughs> example." Did he really sell the rings for Sauron, which is 100 percent true? But so I'm going to give an example of the real ability of Andrew to to just make people accepting what happens and really hammer home how great he is. He recently went out to a restaurant, and when the waiter brought him his food and said, enjoy your food, he responded with, I love you too. And not only was it not awkward for either one of them, but he truly believed what Andrew had said, and he left that day at work happier than when he arrived. Yeah, he left That's me a tip that night. It was uh, <laughs> a nice turn. That's wonderful. Yeah. I love the story. And, so, and, and that's the level of just pure enthusiasm and shilling ability that we're bringing for uh, what, what would we call this power shill, shill of the ride? I don't know. <laughs> go, 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 Andrew. It's the shill of the ride. Okay. The power shill, if you will. Um, I thank you for sharing that very personal, intimate moment I shared um, accidentally with the waiter, with the world. Um, yeah, so if you like the podcast, if you, you're still listening to us, you heard our talks, we've really covered quite a bit of ground today. Um, I feel like if you're still listening, you're definitely a friend of the show. You're definitely in this community. I hope you're related to a lot of the things we talked about. Um, if you have any feedback, you can email us, powershell at pdq.com, or you can tweet us at the PowerShell podcast. And if you did like what you heard today, you can like us and leave a review on your podcast platform of choice. Or if you're on YouTube, you know, a huge website, you can go ahead and leave a little comment, hit a little like button. Um, Maybe tell us what your favorite module is and go ahead and subscribe if you'd like to. Thank you so much to our fantastic guest, um, Matthias. Thank you so much for joining us. You're most welcome. Pleasure. Thanks for listening to the PowerShell Podcast with your hosts, Jordan Hammond and Andrew Plaw. Two kinds of flavor, two kinds of crunch. The PowerShell Podcast is a production of PDQ.com, making device management simple, secure, and pretty damn quick.